Hello and welcome once more to The Pastor Study. I'm the pastor, Dave Thomas, lead pastor of Cross of Christ Lutheran Church in beautiful Bellevue, Washington. And this is our study for March 21st, 2021, the fifth and final Sunday in Lent. We're here in my study on a rather rainy Thursday afternoon. But I'm glad you're here and I welcome you as we enter into this time of study of God's Word. We also will be heading then uh, out of the season of Lent and into Holy Week. We have special services uh, planned. Next Sunday, our study will be for the Palm Sunday texts, and we will also then share with you recorded videos for Palm Sunday and during Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and of course, Easter Sunday in a couple of weeks too. But let's join in now with our first lesson for this week. This is Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, well known. Uh, and one of uh, my favorites as well is will be read for us by our director of worship and music ministries, Ben Fowler, this week. So um, before we even start, we're going to start before we start. And that is because there is a Hebrew word that can be translated or can be translated without being translated. Is that clear already? Let me explain. It's the Hebrew word hina, and it's it's meant as a stress indicator. It stresses the following word. Now, it can be translated, and it is in uh, the King James and in other versions of the Bible with words like lo, or look, or hear, or behold, or lo and behold. But uh, in the Revised Standard Version, it's not. It's actually translated by the word surely that comes in just a bit, or certainly, or indeed. So, hina. So here we go. Let's start with the New Revised Standard Version's translation, and I'll show you where that happens. Verse 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. So, lo, the days are coming, or uh, for sure the days are coming. That's the hina there. Uh, there is an emphasis uh, on the certainty here. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. This is Yahweh. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Literally, the Hebrew word here means to cut or to sever. Covenants in biblical times, uh, both among the Jews and other ancient Near Eastern folk, were sealed between the two parties, often by the severing of an animal, uh, with the implication that that is what would happen to the party who broke the covenant. Uh, so we, we have this phrase, to cut a deal, or to cut a covenant, literally. Uh, so Yahweh here is saying through the prophet Jeremiah, uh, the days are coming when I will cut a covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Just as a reminder, the uh, Hebrew word Israel means God strives, El being generic for God, and the word Judah is the word for praise or praised. Um, on the succession of King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, in 930, we get these two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Before that, they were united kingdoms, and before that, they weren't a kingdom at all. So sometimes we just talk about Israel or about, um, I suppose, even less so about Judah. But in our Old Testament history, about 900 plus years before the coming of Christ, the two kingdoms divided. Um, the kingdom of Israel, which includes the cities of Shechem and Samaria, uh, is in the north, and then the kingdom of Judah, where lies Jerusalem, is in the south. So the northern kingdom is Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel uh, falls first uh, over history, uh, and becomes part of that becomes the region then becomes known as Samaria, and Judah uh, then becomes the remaining kingdom. Of course, it uh, nearly falters uh, on several occasions, but that's why we have these two kingdoms. So, um, again, God through Jeremiah says, I will make a new covenant. I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this will be, uh, God says, uh, different than previous covenants, a new covenant. Well, what are some of the other covenants? Well, there are five 
main covenants that most scholars will point to in the Old Testament. The first is the covenant that God makes with Noah. Behold, I will put my bow, my rainbow in the sky. I will no, never again destroy the earth by a flood. Then the covenant that God makes with Abraham or Abraham and Sarah. Uh, I will give you land. I will make your descendants greater than the grains of the sands or the stars in the skies. From you shall come many nations. The covenant, uh, the Mosaic covenant, God makes a covenant with Moses and through Moses with his people. In the giving of the law, if you keep my law, uh, these blessings will come your way. If you don't, other things will happen. And then the Davidic covenant, uh, the covenant God makes with David, that from David's line will come the Messiah. And now God declares that there will be a new covenant. This is the covenant uh, that foreshadows the coming of Messiah, uh, the coming of Christ. So these five main covenants. And God declares that this new covenant days are coming, and he describes them. As we go on in verse 32, it will be not like the covenant that I made with your ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. So this is a reference to the Mosaic covenant. God gives the law and the people promise to keep it. God promises to bless them if they do, but to take away their blessings if they do not. And part of the covenant is that the people are to serve as a light to the nations by living according to God's holy code. The law does not save or redeem or justify or make righteous God's people. It sets them apart by their living. God is entering into covenant and claiming them as his own. And as his own, they will thus live. And that's um, something that we can reflect on in our understanding of being saved or made right with God that God does this unilaterally out of God's great love for us. But in response, we are called to live as God's people, not to earn God's forgiveness, but having received God's forgiveness by grace, we desire to live as God's people. And uh, so then Jesus emphasized the great, uh, two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor. So um, this is the covenant that, the Mosaic Covenant is the one here in Jeremiah that God is referring to through the prophet that uh, your ancestors broke. Uh, but now God describes how the New Covenant will be different from the one that I made with your ancestors. This is verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, compared to the writing of the law, um, the Ten Commandments. Uh, on stone tablets. Now, God's law will be written in the hearts of humans. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is the relational, non, not transactional nature of the new covenant. The Mosaic covenant was transactional. Transactional. Uh, you keep the, I will give you the law, and you keep it. If you keep it, I will bless you. If you don't, I won't. Bad things will happen. In the New Covenant, the, relation, the uh, covenant is based on relationship. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Going on, no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Unlike in the past, when people needed Moses and others to interpret and teach the law to be their, their go-between, their mediator, under the New Covenant, God says, that he will place the law in the hearts of his own people. All right, so that's the first lesson. The second um, text that we come up to uh, this Sunday is Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12, and both Ben and I will camp the psalm this week. I haven't um, participated in that in a while, and I asked Ben if I might, and he graciously allowed. So we will be uh, responsibly singing, canting the Psalm 51. Now, Psalm 51 is based uh, on an incident in the life of David as recorded in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. This is King David at his worst. He uses his powers and his positions to lure a lovely young lady that, he, um, catch, that catches his eye while she is bathing uh, on her rooftop, which would be customary. No indoor plumbing, right? Um, and... Um, he uh, lusts after her and makes arrangements uh, for her to be brought to him. Uh, how is she to deny the king? And uh, he 
lures, arranges, forces, there's debate about this, um, Bathsheba into this adulterous relationship, which is bad enough. But then he plots to have her husband, Uriah, murdered. Uriah is an officer in his army and serves him faithfully on the battlefield, but David will be unfaithful to him. He will tell his um, other generals and leaders, uh, go into battle, and when it's time to charge, give the sound, but don't go forward. Just Uriah will lead the charge. And of course, Uriah is slaughtered uh, on the battlefield. Um, So David doesn't directly murder, but he plots the murder of Uriah. Now, David's advisor, the prophet Nathan, uh, in whom David often confides, uh, confronts David and uh, tells him a story about a man who had plenty of sheep but wanted another one and took it from someone who had only one. And David is outraged over that, and then Nathan says, you are that man. And David acknowledges his sin and recognizes his wrongdoing. So now this Psalm 51 is David confessing his wrongdoing to God in psalmic form. It's regarded as a model of repentance in both Christianity and Judaism, and we often hear it during Lent. So here it is, Psalm 51, 1 through 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. This is God's hased. We've talked about this, God's faithfulness, kindness, grace, God's um, loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. The word here for blot means to wipe away, uh, particularly with a cloth, as one might blot away a tear, or uh, as someone might blot their lips, perhaps a woman fixing her lipstick uh, to remove, um, you know, smudged lipstick or such to remove tears. This is the word here. We have to blot out. Now, we can think of blot out like a cloud blots out, blots out the sun. Uh, and that's accurate, sure. Uh, but here the sense of the word is more to, to dab, to remove that which is um, causing the offense. Or to wipe away a tear, to blot him out. All right. Verse 2. Wash me through and through from my wickedness. The Hebrew word here is repeated for emphasis. Uh, It means uh, many or much or often or copiously. So um, wash me over and over and over and over again. Uh, Wash me uh, often. Wash me again and again from my wickedness. And cleanse me from my sin. Uh, That word can also be translated as purify. Uh, Both physically and spiritually, this word is applied to cleansing, purification. All right. Next verse is three, for I know my offenses. That is, I have become aware. I have come to recognize. I have come to acknowledge. After Nathan's confrontation, David acknowledges his sinfulness. It's not like, what? What are you saying? I don't remember doing that. Not that kind of, I know my offenses, but I have, I recognize, I acknowledge. And my sin is ever before me. Next verse, again, Uh, Or against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Well, every time I hear that, I think, well, one could argue that with you, David. Indeed, King David sinned against God, but also against Bathsheba and Uriah and against his army and his officers and those that he basically commanded to step back and leave Uriah defenseless. David sins against his people. He violates his office and his divinely appointed leadership. It's not entirely accurate to say against only God have I sinned in this case, and usually not in our cases either. Um, The transgression of, of sin breaks relationship with God, and in, in that way, we can only sin against God or God's law, but The acts that are perpetrated or even the thoughts or attitudes often bring harm to others. So I know it's in the Bible and everything, right? But I would take I would take David up on this point. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. But we go on. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgments. At least here David makes no excuses or tries to justify himself. 
he is guilty. He knows he's guilty. He confesses to God he is guilty. And God would be absolutely justified ju justified in condemning him for his sin. All right, moving on. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Yes, again, we would say that is true. Indeed, all humans are born into fallen sinful humanity. We inherit this condition. But David also sins uh, by his actions. These are what are called sins of commission. Uh, these are sins that David decided upon, he acted upon, he is guilty of, not just by his nature is he sinful, but by his choices. All right, next verse. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. You know, David is described as a man or a person after God's own heart, and it's his desire to know God that is one reason why. David, like all of us, though, is a mixed bag, right? Uh, he's full of good intentions and sometimes very righteous acts, but he can also act very selfishly and very sinfully, including some really big things uh, that are reflected in this 51st Psalm. All right, next verse. Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Again, David, once more, um, pleads with God for cleansing. He asks the Lord to purge him with hyssop to make him clean. Uh, to purge uh, means to purify, as we said, to remove stain. Hyssop is a plant that uh, priests of the Old Testament would use in ceremonial cleansing. They would dip a bunch or a branch or a they'd grab hyssop, um, and it would be dipped in the blood of sacrificial animals and then sprinkled uh, on people for uh, cleansing. It was a religious rite or ritual. Uh, it's uh, described in Leviticus 14, 4 through 7. Um, it's uh, prescribed for people who have leprosy uh, to be cleansed. So that's what hyssop is. Remove my sin with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be pure with snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that my body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my wickedness. Again, David longs to have his relationship with God restored through God's mercy and forgiveness. He wants more than to uh, get out of jail free. He wants to be changed. Um, it's one thing to confess our sins. It's another thing to... Uh, do an about face, to change our ways, um, to uh, realign ourselves back with God's will. So David speaks about this in verse, in the next verse that is uh, words that are well known to us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Words that we've heard many times set to music even. David's heart had been full of lust for Bathsheba, now murderous plans for Uriah and rebellion against God. So now he rightly desires a new heart, one that is full of love for God and hates evil. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. So that's the Psalm 51 for this last Sunday in Lent. The second lesson, uh, our New Testament lesson, is from the book of Hebrews. Chapter 5, verse 5 to 10, and congregational president, and recording, uh, worship recording everything. Editor, producer, videographer, Colin Walker is our lector. So there is a lot of debate about who wrote Hebrews. There is no consensus. It's not assigned to any one of the apostles or any of one of their followers. Uh, it is left without, it's, the book doesn't say who writes it. Well, the book doesn't say, there's no inscription, there's no salutation. Uh, and so, um, generally, most Bible scholars uh, leave that authorship unascribed, unassigned. The unknown to us author of Hebrews, but certainly not unknown to his readers, uh, and uh, to the greater community. Uh, so we will just have to deal with that mystery. So this is from the author of Hebrews, chapter 5. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed one by the one who said of him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. 
as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So these are in quote marks in our Bible. You are my son today, I've begotten you. This is a um, the author of Hebrews quoting his scripture, Hebrew scriptures, Old Testament, and in particular, Psalm 2-7. And then he quotes Psalm 110 in saying, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So let's talk a little bit about who this Melchizedek, Melchizedek is and uh, the role of the priest. Uh, these words uh, obviously are assigned about Christ, written about Christ. So a mediator, uh, priest is a mediator, uh, a go-between between God and humans. Uh, and in the Old Testament, one didn't just wake up and decide, hey, you know what, I think I'll, when I grow up I want to be a priest. Um, you had to be from a particular tribe, and the role was assigned to you. So that's the reference there. Christ didn't claim the role. That was assigned to him. Those who are legitimate priests must be appointed to the position by God. And this is even more important in respect to the role of the high priest. The prior verses have explained that Jesus was specifically placed in his role by God. This is Hebrews, um, the second chapter. And again in 5.4, that he didn't simply assume the mantle of high priest uh, by his own decision. Uh, John 8.54 talks about this. In other passages in Hebrew, the writer seeks to use Old Testament passages like he does here to prove his point. Here, again, quotes the psalm, Psalm 2, Psalm 110. So on to Melchizedek. Well, his name means righteous king. And we run into Melchizedek uh, only a couple of times. One is in the book of Genesis, the 14th chapter, when he is introduced to us as the king of Salem, uh, a salam, peace, and the priest of the Most High God. Um, and here in the 14th chapter of Genesis, Abram, later renamed Abraham, is returning from a victorious battle against another king, the king of Elam. And Melchizedek comes out to greet Abram, uh, to congratulate him on his victory, and to offer him bread and wine, and to bless him in the name of the Most High God, whom Melchizedek praises as the true source of the victory. Uh, so that's pretty much the action of Melchizedek in Scripture. Now, the Jewish association or identification of Melchizedek with the Messiah predates Christianity. Uh, the expectation is, uh, among uh, Jewish scholars, that the Messiah will be along the line of Melchizedek. In Christianity... Though uh, we are not awaiting another Messiah or someone else as the Messiah, we understand Christ to be the Messiah. And so uh, our Christological interpretation of this Old Testament character is as a uh, prefiguring or a prototype of the Christ, of the Messiah, uh, as a righteous priest and a foreshadowing of this type of priest-king figure that the Messiah will be, that Jesus was. Um, associating Jesus with other Old Testament characters, uh, what's called topography or topological association, comparing Jesus to other uh, Old Test to other Old Testament figures happens often in the New Testament, not just here, uh, as he is associated or compared with Melchizedek. Uh, Christ is called the Second Adam or the new Adam. He is compared with Abraham. Uh, and the association goes further. The bread and wine offered by Abraham, or by Melchizedek to Abram, or Abraham, uh, was interpreted, especially in the early church, by early church fathers, as being a prefiguration of the Eucharist, uh, as a symbol of Holy Communion. So what's the point? Why is the author of Hebrews bringing all of this up? Well, I think the main point that the author is trying to make is that Jesus is the perfect and ultimate priest or mediator or intercessor between humans and God. He is both high priest and Messiah and king. So he is all of these, king of kings, the ultimate high priest, and the Christ, the Messiah. He's also the suffering servant referred to in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, mm -hmm. as the author picks up next in the verses 
that uh, we have that I think most link this lesson to Lent. So we're moving on now, finally, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, that is, in Jesus' earthly time, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Now, most scholars would hear this as a reference to the fervent prayers of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on what we now call Monday Thursday. So fervent were his prayers that we are told that he um, sweat blood. And he asked the Father, if possible, that this cup would be removed, this cup of suffering. But, uh, as Jesus adds, not my will but thine. So verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, a couple of important points here. First, we hear uh, that he, Jesus, the son, learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, the concept here of learning is uh, learning obedience, um, as expressed in the Greek, is more closely associated to the idea not of coming to a conceptual understanding, but by, of learning through experience or through doing. Uh, it um, captures the, the, the idea that we might think of as um, someone who is an apprentice or someone who's being tutored, someone who's learning something by doing it, learning a craft alongside a master craftsman as an apprentice might. So we could say that um, Jesus put into practice his obedience to the Father by his suffering. It's less about learning about it, like learning what suffering is, and it's more about practicing his obedience um, in and through his suffering. Okay, does that make sense? So he learned obedience, he practiced his obedience um, through his suffering. Secondly, we hear something else that might trip us up. It says, um, the writer says, having been made perfect. And we might stop and say, well, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was perfect, right? Um, in the sense of sinless. And yes, Jesus is described as being uh, perfect uh, in this sense, sinless. Uh, Jesus didn't need to become perfect. Uh, there certainly weren't any imperfections that he had to work out through suffering, as some has interpreted through the history of the church. So there's some insight again here from the Greek itself. The Greek word here for that's translated as perfect in English is teleothesis. And teleothesis uh, or teleothesis means something that is complete or completed or accomplished or has met its goal. A related word, teleos, is a, the word for a goal or a target. It can mean a target, oops, sorry, a target like shooting at something. It can also mean the goal or the ob the uh, uh, objective. It's a word that is used to describe a finish line in a race. So in writing that Jesus, having been made perfect, the author of Hebrews is indicating that by his obedience, his suffering, and his sacrificial death, Jesus perfectly, fully completed his goal or mission as high priest in making an offering acceptable unto God, and he was himself that offering, the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. So don't get tripped up in that idea that Jesus was imperfect and then he suffered and he became perfect. But Jesus perfected, completed, accomplished his mission through his suffering on the cross. Um, another writer in the New Testament, Paul, also uses this word a couple of times, this teleosis or teleo um, root words. One is in Philippians 3.12, when he writes, Not that I have already reached this goal, teleos, but I press on to make it my own. So that's that sense, this goal or this target or this completion of, of something. All right, so finally we're coming to our gospel. This is the gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 26. Uh, and this is um, an encounter. Actually, it's not an encounter. It's the story of some folks coming wanting to get introduced to Jesus. Uh, this is, um, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and uh, this is nearing the time of the events that we will commemorate in Holy Week. So here we go. We're going to start with verse 20. We'll go through 26. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. 
And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So there's a little bit that needs to be unpacked here to understand the context. Uh, those who went up to worship at the festival, the festival that we're talking about here is Passover, which Jesus and his disciples will also celebrate um, in the upper room. This is one of the festivals for which Jewish men are required to make a pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem, um, Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. Uh, as a result, during Passover, at this time and in every Passover, uh, Jerusalem was packed with visitors from all over the place, many of whom um, also celebrated Jesus as he entered into the city on a donkey, which John has just described earlier, uh, just the verses before, 12 to 19. So Jesus comes humbly uh, in what we call the triumphant entry, uh, which we will again commemorate next Sunday for Palm Sunday. Now, not all of those who were in Jerusalem uh, who came uh, up to worship at the festival for Passover were themselves Jewish. That is, they weren't, um, they were non-Israelites, uh, they were not Jews by birth or ethnicity, but they were, as described here, Greeks, or we might say Gentiles. Uh, the term just means those who are not Jews, uh, and Gentile, and in this case, uh, these Hellenists, these Greeks, those of that heritage. They are likely what the scripture calls uh, God-fearers. Uh, they may have been full converts to Judaism, proselytes. Um, and in any event, they are coming to practice this Jewish requirement of worshiping, uh, of celebrating the festival of Passover in Jerusalem. Jesus has just entered in quite a spectacle and uh, they uh, clearly have heard something about him, and they seek out those who are associated with him, and one of those being Philip, who we'll talk about in just a bit more. So they come to uh, Philip and say, we want to see Jesus. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us why these guys approach Philip. It could have been just they saw him hanging out with Jesus and thought, well, let's ask this guy. But um, it may be that they sought him out specifically. They might have chosen him due to his Greek name. Uh, Philip, among the, the apostles, bears a Greek name. Now, they may not have known that, but he may have been Greek in appearance. Uh, and uh, so they might have thought, well, here's somebody that's more like us, so let's ask. Um, they may have chosen him because uh, he was from Bethsaida, uh, which is a, a village that is known to have had a population of both Jews and Gentiles or Greeks. Now, there are other disciples from Bethsaida besides Philip. It's, um, Bethsaida is a fishing village on the eastern, northeastern uh, side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and those uh, include uh, Andrew and his brother Simon, who will later be renamed Peter by Jesus. You might also know that there are other fishing brothers, James and John, fishermen like Andrew and Simon, who lived very nearby, not in Bethsaida, but just close by. So uh, to make it even more confusing, there's another Philip in the New Testament, and we want to keep them straight. Uh, this is Philip the Apostle uh, from Bethsaida, friends with Andrew and Simon. Um, the other is uh, often called uh, Philip the Evangelist or Philip the Deacon. Um, so uh, we run into him in Acts when the first deacons are called, Stephen and Philip and others. What do we know about Philip the Apostle, the one in this story? Well, he, um, he only gets one other really, uh, one or two other speaking roles uh, in uh, the Gospels. Uh, he is, uh, Philip is, Philip the Apostle is the one who, when Jesus is um, gathered with 5,000 folks who are listening to him preach, and uh, it is time, it's near the end of the day, and it's time to, to worry about what they will eat. It's Philip who comes uh, to Jesus and says, what should we do? 
And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And Philip replies, it would take more than a half a year's wage to buy enough bread for each one of these to have even just a bite. So, um, truth, but uh, we know what happens. Aside from this account, the only other speaking role Philip gets in the gospel is not a very positive one. He asked Jesus, show us the Father. Uh, to which Jesus replies, Do you, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has already seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So that, that account's recorded just two chapters earlier in John 10. So um, back to this account, however. Philip plays the role of a conduit or a go-between for these Greek men. And you can see that the stories that we have, the Bible accounts, have this concept of conduits or go-betweens or, or emissaries or mediators, Melchizedek. And um, the, in the uh, Hebrews writing, Jesus as our high priest. So um, Philip, in this case, uh, is approached by these Greek men and uh, Philip hears their request and he goes to Andrew. And together, Andrew and Philip go to Jesus. And so after all of that background, we're back to our reading, verse 22. So Philip went and told Andrew and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, verily, in New King James, King James, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. Um, it gets translated grain of wheat, or it could be translated kernel. The Greek word here is kokos, K-O-K-K-O-S, transliterated into English, kappa, omicron, kappa, kappa, omicron, sigma. Uh, it's spelled in English, C-O-C-C-U-S, in the fields of botany, where it refers to a plant with berries or seeds in this coccus or oval shape, and in bacteriology, where it describes berry or, or uh, seed-shaped microorganisms. And you have actually heard this word in other words, such as staphylococcus or staphylococcus or streptococcus. Um, any of those cocci or coccus bacterias, that can cause us harm? Go back to this reading. So there you go. Trivia for today. Very truly, I tell you, unless a, a coccus, a kernel, a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single grain, Jesus says. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, Jesus here, of course, is speaking of his own death. But he is also making it clear to his followers already, Philip and Andrew and others, and to potential followers like these Greek men who want to come and see him or know him, uh, that to follow him is to also follow his selfless way of servanthood, to die to self and to live to God and for one one's neighbors. As Jesus says in verse 25, those who love their life will lose it. But those who hate their life in this world We'll keep it for eternal life. Now, loving and hating here are being used as measures of value. They're not actual emotions. You don't have to hate your life to love God. But relative to how much you love God, it's like you have no measure of love that equal. It's like hating your life. It's so different in, in emphasis and value. And then we finish with verse 26. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. And so that's the end of our gospel lesson and the end of our pastor's study for this week. Again, I want to invite you to uh, join us for recorded worship. We have a lot of upcoming worship services this Sunday, the last Sunday of Lent. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We'll have special recorded services for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday of Holy Week. And of course, the celebration of Easter on Easter Sunday, April 4. We also are offering to our members Holy Week worship bags, which have items to help you engage in worship in each of those services and some goodies and treats as well. They're being put together by our associate pastor for Caring Ministries, Judy 
uh, Brennan. And joining Pastor Judy is the other Judy, Judy Geisbert, our office administrator, who's doing a lot of the work of crafting them and getting the items together. And we will make these available to you next week. They will be available on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday afternoon. And the times uh, when you can come and pick them up are in the email that uh, will be sent uh, with the link to this week's worship. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me uh, as well. And uh, I hope that you'll come and get your worship bags. If you're not able to during those times or just not able to at all and would like um, to receive a bag, please contact Pastor Judy. She's arranging for some to be mailed and some to be delivered as well. But I think they'll really um, help you engage in the worship services. We wish we could be worshiping together in person, but as we worship together differently, we're hoping that this will add to your Holy Week experience. Well, you've added to my preparation time for the service and the sermon for this Sunday, Lent 5, and I thank you for the time you spent with me here in the pastor's study. Until next time, let us be doers of God's word and not hearers only. See you soon. Bye-bye.